All right, well, why don't we get started? I think we got a pretty good crowd. I think we're going to have more people joining in over time. But let me just begin by saying, Howard, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And thank you also for your work in putting the book together. I, I am obsessed with this book. I think I've probably read through it uh, three or four times at this point. And I'm, I'm, I'm still eager to keep reading it because there's so many interesting insights. But mm. thank you for uh, all the work that you and Nancy uh, put into the book. It's, it's really a, a gift to the field. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. But today we're going to talk about you. So um, I've, I sent out information about Howard's bio, uh, very impressive bio in mediation and ombuds. I mean, the man is, is a legend. Um, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to read through his bio because that's kind of the purpose of this call is sort of to talk through all the aspects of that. But um, if any of you do have a copy of the book, I think it'll be helpful to have it in front of you. And also in the invitation, there was a link to the PDF version of Howard's chapter. So I encourage you to, to pull that up uh, so that you can take a look at, at some of the things. I'm going to ask Howard to read a couple paragraphs out of his chapter that I think are, are particularly good. But let, let's start at the beginning, Howard. Sure. So uh, one of the first questions I want to ask you, it, it sounds like you had a very happy childhood, um, first in Brooklyn and then Queens. But um, I was just wondering, you know, you, you titled your chapter The Accidental Ombudsman, which I think yeah. is a great, a great title. But what do you think about your upbringing you know, led you? To the career that you had, do you see any any roots back in your childhood uh, that that uh, maybe led you in that direction? Yeah, I, I've thought about that, um, and I mean, of course, it's easy in retrospect to identify a connection between past events and the present. Sure, that may not have been there. Um, the 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 thing that I think of most is. Um, being tuned in to my mother's concealed pain. Mm, interesting. And this, this having a sense of, as a kid, mm -hmm. that there was more going on in her th that affected the way she was in the world than, than was visible. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I remember just sort of being, trying to read what was going on with her, uh, picking up signs of pain that weren't explicit, but indicators of that. It is interesting how many of the chapters people talk about, they had a turbulent childhood and they were yeah. sort of as a child put into the role of peacemaker a little bit. But it's interesting too, because your path into the field was through uh, psychology. And yeah. I could, maybe that also was connected to that, that sense yeah. kids can be very perceptive in their parents, even if they don't have the language for it. So maybe that was, that was part of it as yeah. well. And it was not a turbulent childhood. My sister and I were considered the model brother and sister in wow. our neighborhood. We got along well, we didn't fight, we supported one another. Um, there were no major tensions, you know, mm -hmm. un until adolescence hit. Um, Sure. Well, I love how you said your house only had six books. I yeah. mean, it's amazing that you led a life of letters when uh, that, that wasn't something it sounded like you, you had early exposure to. Uh, no, I, I didn't. That just, that just came about from, you know, going to good public schools in New York City. Wow, that's and great. Having an appreciation of reading and learning. And I remember, you know, early on being excited about that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one, one of the other things is growing up in the 60s. I mean, uh, when you talk yeah. about sort of being at UMass in the late 60s and early 70s, it sounds like that was an incredibly heady time. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and I, I think it's, it's not just your family, it was everything that was going on in society, you know, so, and I, and I love the story that you tell about uh, your confrontation with Hubert Humphrey. Um, yeah. But how do you think that growing up through that era also shaped your, your worldview? I loved how you said um, you weren't content with being content. Yeah. Um, it, it, um, it, it's funny because I was, it was really in the earliest days in the 50s that I first got engaged by, by that kind of, of uh, you know, by civil rights issues uh -huh. were, were the first issues that grabbed me. And I, and um, again, it was sort of connected to some sense, and I don't know where it came from, but some sense of 
the importance of justice and fairness and how, and, and this is a kid's understanding. I'm not talking about sophisticated understanding. I'm talking about, you know, the way in which kids have a sense of fairness and justice. Sure. Even, even in grade school, right. oh, yeah. oh, oh, always be being tuned in to that. Hmm. Um, and it, it, but it's not, it, it's not sophisticated. It's not conceptually complex in any way. That stuff comes along much later and just sort of hooking on to it. But that inch, that one of the things you describe, I think, um, really uh, evocatively in the chapter is sort of the, the turbulence on campus during the late yeah. 60s, early 70s, and, you know, about the protests. And, uh, you, know, you know, you talk about uh, negotiating with a group of students that, were, that had thought about bombing a building on campus, yes. you know. I mean, I think for, for somebody who was born in 70, you know, I heard about all of that stuff in the yeah, 60s. Yeah. But it's almost, it's very interesting because it has some parallels, uncomfortable parallels with the world we're in today. And, I, and yeah. it's interesting that your role in all of that is what led some of the administrators at UMass to think you might be good in the ombuds role. Um, so talk a little bit more about that, if you would. Well, the, the, I think I talk in the chapter about remembering when the ombuds role was first established right. at the university and With being Dutch. skeptical of it because I saw that as the kind of another effort at co-opting the energy behind student protests and student activism and and, and at that point, not just students, but others as well, who were anti-war and pro-civil rights and all of that. And um, it, one of the things that my involvement did was brought me as, because I was a junior faculty member, I was just starting out as a faculty member, but that brought me a kind of visibility on campus that I would not have had otherwise. Uh -huh. um, and, and uh, I was also at the time I was teaching a very large introductory psychology class. Mm -hmm. we, we had four sections of 500 students each, um, each semester. So wow. was 2000 students a semester. I mean, psych was booming as My a major. Gosh. Yeah. Um, so, so, so there was that. And then um, after the Humphrey incident, there were newspaper editorials. There was an editorial in the Boston Globe demanding that I be fired and a variety of things like that. Um, but I think because of that visibility, um, when they were looking at Janet Rifkin, some people may know her or of her, but she was one of the early leaders in mediation to set up, I think, the first campus-based mediation program. She did? Yeah. yeah. She was a legal studies professor, and she was a close friend of mine, and she had been in the ombuds position, and she was leaving the position. She was about to have her second child, and she wanted a break, and just asked me if I would be willing to be considered and it just sounded like a potentially interesting break from a regular faculty role. I was a little bit tired of my department. Um, it was heavily dominated by Dust Bowl empiricists um, and I didn't really fit in. I was more and more attracted to critical thinking and critical theory and I was uh -huh. teaching courses in critical theory and with a colleagues in philosophy and political science, we taught one of the first courses on Foucault in wow. the United States. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. We, That's taken over since. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were all having trouble understanding it. So we decided let's teach a course in it. That's the only way to learn about it. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea of being committed to doing something for two years, part-time is which, what it was, sounded okay. You, you know, it just sounded like an interesting break. Absolutely. Any expectation. And I was told that um, afterwards that one of the reason I was selected is because people felt I wouldn't be afraid of the administration. Mm. And, and and at that point, I also had tenure, so sure. I, I you know, I, I so you had an additional layer of security. Yeah, yeah and I, I think didn't have to worry about being unemployed. Yeah, 
Well, your willingness to speak truth to power with the Humphrey situation and your ability to communicate with all different kinds of groups on campus, I could see how people would say, oh, this guy'd be great for ombuds because he's, you know, he's willing to take on the big, so, big topics. I have to go because yeah. I have to jump on uh, a oh, Zoom. Let me do a mute here. Okay, uh, okay. bye-bye. All right, there we go. Um, yeah, so, so actually, I think there are three big, so let's talk about your path through the field, the conflict resolution okay. field, um, because I think there are three big chapters that you talk, uh, talk about in, uh, there are three big stages in your yeah. chapter. There's the UMass chapter, and then there's the UCLA chapter, and then yeah. there's the NIH chapter. Right. So, right. you know, Janet was actually the reason why I got into the conflict resolution field as well. I read her book, Peaceful Persuasion, which was a guidebook for setting up campus mediation yeah. programs. Yeah. And so I so I share that with you. Yeah. But it, it sounds like your first training was with the legendary Albie Davis. Yes. Um, can, what do you remember about that? Well, uh, Albie and Janet were close friends. Mm -hmm. And so I... I mean, it was literally the case that I came out of one case that I had worked on where I had tried to bring together two people in dispute. And um, it, it, it was just brutal, you know. I, and it was funny because I had had training in um, family therapy and individual therapy. So I thought you'd bring people together. It's not, and I just got really beat up by that. So Janet sure. had me call Albie and I arranged to go into Boston for... Uh, one of the next trainings that Albie was doing. Uh -huh. And that began a friendship with Albie as well. And That's since great. Albie and Janet were so close and I, Janet and I were close, we were all had occasion to get together to talk and work That's together great. and talk about the field. And you did some family mediation. You had a family mediation practice early on too, right? Y yes, that, that came, yeah, because I had... My degree was in experimental psychology, studying visual perception. But after I got my PhD, I did an intern, a clinical internship in the clinic at the university. And I got training in both family and individual therapy. So I, I had this idea of um, applying some of the sensibility and techniques from family therapy to work in mediation. You know, one of the, the things you write about very, very movingly in your piece is sort of the, the early work you did with sexual harassment. And I, I'm thinking that you were doing this work in the 80s, you know, when, when yeah. even the notion of sexual harassment, I think about Catherine McKinnon, it was still very early in that. But it's yeah. amazing to think what's happened between the 80s to now with Me Too and all of that. And I, yeah. I, thought, I, I thought it was very interesting, your reflection on that. So I, I was wondering, you know, what, what was it like to work with those kinds of cases early well, in It was interesting because we didn't even, I remember the discussions within the university administration about whether there should be a policy on sexual harassment, you know, mm -hmm. and then finally the decisions that, that there ought to be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, to be truthful, I sort of hint at this in the chapter. Um, I First of all, there was just the sheer number of cases coming in from so many different women, mostly women, not only, but mostly, at so many different levels of the organization, you know, students and faculty and staff members and people in the ground crew and uh, one woman plumber I remember wow. who, you know, commented on the way she had to dress as a plumber and the idea that people were coming on to her in her plumber outfit was just so absurd. Wow. Um, so it, 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 it I, I wasn't prepared for, I didn't know that went on, you know, as, as I said, I had this romanticized notion about student faculty relationships then there was this sense of emancipation mm -hmm. and it wasn't uncommon for students and faculty to be involved sexually mm -hmm. um, and more than anything more than anything else about doing the ombuds work that one got to me mm -hmm. i mean it, the, the range of cases, I mean, it was, it was over the course of the 10 years at, at UMass, there were literally hundreds of cases of sexual harassment that wow. came to me. Plus, 
the way in which it required of me in, in a way in which I'm sort of still embarrassed to think about, to have to think back about what my relationships with women had been like. Absolutely. You, you know, on, on campus and, and, and the kinds of things that, um, the kinds of rationale and justifications I gave to myself uh -huh. that are so transparently, you know, self-promotional and, and, and um, there, there, there was a lot of sort of apologizing to be done, uh -huh. uh, you, you know, and, um, it, and I, but I think, I think it helped not just with the sexual harassment cases, but there were a lot of cases in which you're dealing with a situation where somebody has really been miserable in their treatment of other people or unfair in their treatment of other people. Uh -huh. And it's very easy to demonize people who are like that. But if, you're ref if I'm reflecting on what my own interactions with people had been like and what women had been like, then there's a... a, a there's a possible basis for being more, I don't know what the word is, sympathetic isn't quite right, but more understanding of mm -hmm. people who mistreat other people. Absolutely. That, you know, that, that they're, they're still maybe, they may be awful people in some way, mm -hmm. um, but, but we, we all are capable of deluding ourselves. And it's not everything evil is done out of malicious intent. And it was important to realize that. I remember one case, a sexual harassment case, uh, someone who was a colleague and a friend of mine from another department, but a friend of mine, and who shared many of the same values and political activities I had and all of that. And when the third sexual harassment complaint against him came to my office, um, and this was the third, this was again before it was really a good policy for bringing formal charges. Um, but the story that I heard from this third young woman was so similar to the others that I went to him and I said, this has got to stop. And if I hear one more complaint about you, I will resign from my position because I'm pledged to confidentiality and report you to the chancellor. Wow. Oh and that, it, 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 you know, that was hard. Yeah. Um, but it worked. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, you said earlier uh, when I asked about your childhood, you know, what were the roots of your work in this field? And you said, well, insights, you know, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, yeah. And I think what uh, there's always a danger in interpreting the past through the lens of the present. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the 70s were a different time than we're in now. But yeah. I think it's interesting that you were on the front lines of this. I think you sort of saw you, you had sort of early dispatches that led yeah. to essentially the creation of the the legal definition of sexual harassment and now the me too movement because yeah. you you know you were seeing this the the myth sort of the consensus attitude towards it was different mm -hmm. than what you were witnessing yeah. and i think that that's that's very interesting that you were you had that that perspective at that time and, and there's a funny way in which it was an advantage to me as a man because there weren't many men who were giving talks about or workshops on sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it also, it coincided with the time, part of it coincided with the time when I was a single parent, my children were living with me mm -hmm. uh, at the time. So most of my friends around parenting were the women who were the wives or girlfriends of my male friends. Mm. So I was also spending a lot of time with women as friends who were talking about their experiences. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I, I was getting a, a, a much more personal take on it. Sure, sure. Outside of the context of the job, but the, everything sort of converged in, in, in my experiences that 
Well, I, I, I want to move on to some other topics as compelling as this one is. Um, one, one of the things that I find fascinating in your chapter, because I've not had the experience of serving as an ombudsperson, and I know we have some people on the call that have had that role. It's yeah. very interesting you having this conversation with your friend in saying, if I get another complaint like this about you, I'm going to resign my role yeah. and go report you to the chancellor. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's a one of the things that I like in terms of the difference between the mediator role and the ombuds role, I think a lot of mediators wrestle with this idea that our obligation is only to the parties in the room, as yeah. opposed to trying to make broader systemic change. And it feels to me that the ombuds role has an embrace of that systemic element, and that really resonated with you. I was actually wondering if you could read a little a paragraph from sure. your chapter. It's at the bottom of page 306, um, and it's after the block quote. Stay here, there. Okay. It starts uh, in my early years. Do you see that? Three oh six. Oh yeah, I 306. see. Three In my early years, and just and ju just read to the top of the next page. I'll stop you. But that's that's the paragraph. Okay, so start with in my early years. Yeah, that. that okay. Paragraph. So in my early years as an ombuds and mediator, I saw conflicts primarily as problems to be overcome, problems for the individuals who were caught up in them, and problems for the organizations in which the conflicts occur. Later, I came to realize that conflicts often also satisfy people's needs. A mediator or ombuds can take away people's conflicts without giving them or helping them get something else in exchange, something that in some way addresses the same needs that the dispute did. That's, I want you to stop there. Okay. Although the rest of that paragraph is also very yeah. interesting. This, this was fascinating to me. And I think I may still be in the middle of this journey that you've already traversed. But can you can you speak to that a little bit, this notion, you know, you, you speak about how at the beginning of this work, you thought, well, maybe we can get rid of all the conflict. Yeah. And only over time did you realize that, you know, that's that's a very naive perspective. Conflicts yeah. meet people's needs. I was wondering if you if you could talk to that a little bit in the in the ombuds role that you had at, at UMass. Yeah. Um... I, and I, I, I don't remember, you know, there wasn't a specific moment at which that idea gelled. It just it was the accumulated realization that um, when, with successful resolutions of situations, uh, some of the same motives that had driven the people into conflict to begin with um, had, had to be satisfied in some other way uh, than, than through that conflict. And I remember, I rem uh, there's like multiple cases coming to mind <laughs> at the same time. So one, one of the things I can start with, with myself, okay? Mm. My image of myself as a young faculty was as someone who was in conflict with the establishment. Mm. And the establishment at the university meant the leaders and the, the administrators and the chancellors and things like that. When I got tenure, my whole sense of self was changed because how can you think of yourself as a Romo against an establishment that has just given you a lifetime position? Mm. Yeah. So I, I needed to sort of, that need to not be inside, that need to not be part of the establishment mm -hmm. had to find some other way of expression just in myself. And thinking of that, I was always looking when I was working with people in conflict, I was always looking to understand what's the needs underneath mm. that are being satisfied by this. Yeah, I, I mean, I do, again, my, my sense of the 60s was that it was a badge of honor to be in conflict with the establishment. Yes. And then when you become part of the establishment, you're like, okay, well, now what do I do? <laughs> you know, like now I guess I'm part of the problem. You know, I, am I the man, you know, yeah. in a sense? Um, so I, th I think that's fascinating. And I want to touch on that again, because let's move to the next chapter when you okay. went to UCLA. And yeah. this, this, is a, this is a huge leap because you're giving up the golden handcuffs of tenure. 
right. you know, you're giving up this, this identity that you forged over, you know, a long period of time at UMass and going out to a very different environment. Talk about, talk about that transformation. It also seems like this is another step in your embrace of it as an identity, as ombuds, as an identity, professional identity for you, separate and apart from the professor identity. Oh yeah, that, that, that was a really big one. I mean, to, to sort of, it wasn't just the giving up tenure, although that, that felt very big at the time, uh -huh. but it was giving up the primary identity as a faculty member, uh -huh. even though I was allowed to teach courses and stuff like that. Give me a second, Howard. I'm going to mute everybody, and then you can unmute yourself so I can block that sound in the back. So if you could unmute yourself again, Howard, now everybody's muted except for you. Oh, Great, thank is you. Is that working? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, but another thing that's very interesting is how, you know, LA differed from Amherst, you know? I mean, I think that was, it sounds like that was a completely new environment for you to do kind of this work. I mean, UCLA is like an urban campus, yep. very inter-ethnic, quite a bit different than rural Western Mass. That was exactly the appeal. You know, I mean, it's the same thing as sort of not wanting to be content. I mean, I knew that I could stay at UMass for the rest of my career, and I knew many people who had done that. And it's the Pioneer Valley, and there were sure. a lot of happy people, and you know, located there. But uh, I wanted to be pushed around more by my life. Mm. I wanted to be challenged more, and the diversity that. of LA was really fascinating for me, especially coming from the East Coast where the primary dynamic is black, white. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's much more complex and multidimensional than, than that. Well, and that's what I wanna ask you about now. The, uh, the campus mediation program that you created yeah. uh, focused on identity-based disputes and also the work you did with Carrie and the yeah. Center for the Study and Resolution of Inter-Ethnic, Interracial Conflict. You describe yeah. this in the chapter as one of the most satisfying experiences of your professional life. So just, what, what was that like? What, what, that, that experience of putting that center together, what lessons did you learn? Well, um, it, it was, um, as I said, I mean, to say it's satisfying, I guess you can't really capture how Part of, there's, there's a way in which as a parent, there are some people who take pleasure in their children being little and suffer as the children mature and become independent. There are other parents who take their pleasure primarily from seeing the growing independence of the, the, their kids. And, and I think of that because what happened was with this program is it engaged, it, 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 we were training students, staff, and faculty, mostly students, some staff and very few faculty, but a few faculty. And they worked together as teams, in, in, in teams, and they worked <laughs> as a team. And it went so quickly from being my program to their program. And it, they took it over. And it wasn't that there was a rebellion or anything like that. They just, it somehow, it, it engaged the people in it in ways in which I had not anticipated. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about satisfying needs. There was, because they, we had class together, we met regularly as a team. We spent a lot of time talking about our identities, the, and the, the identity-based conflicts we were involved in. Huh. And in the same day, you could have one day where we were having a class discussion and it was like the oppression Olympics, you know, each group trying to show that their group was more oppressed than the other. Uh -huh. And then, we would get together to put together teams to address, to, to serve as mediators in conflicts. And the same people who had been opposed to one another in, in their discussion in their class could work together beautifully uh -huh. as a team. 
addressing the very same kind of issues they were in conflict over when it was in, in a discussion between them. I don't know if I've said that clearly enough. No, absolutely. Actually, and, I, yeah, please, please continue. They took over the governance of the program. I mean, the first year I did all the selection, the, the second year they themselves set up criteria and they had to have these discussions. Okay, what's the range of diversity we, we need? And what are the criteria we're going to use? And they worked all this stuff out. And I really was at that point, I may have been the teacher in the class that they took, but in the team, they were the facilitators. I was a, a, a facilitator, but they were, they were the decision makers. And they constructed this amazing thing. It's so amazing. by the second year, we had so many people applying to serve in the program. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, too. Again, this resonates with me. I love what you said about your instinct to go to places where you were challenged. You know, And I think that that's one of the reasons why you were on the front lines in, in learning about sexual harassment at UMass. And it's also one of the reasons why I think you did this work at UCLA. You know, um, my, my thesis in, in college, actually the first pa the, uh, paper I wrote for name was about how to design a student-centered campus mediation program. And that's yeah. exactly what you're doing. You know, one of the mantras of Black Lives Matter now is nothing about us without us. And this whole notion of conflict resolution is something that we can get skilled in and then we can go out and give it to other people. Yeah. I think that's that's been completely that's not the way we think about this now. You know, everyone, yeah. everyone has you, it has to be from the communities themselves. It's not like you could just have a bunch of trained you know, people that have these skills that can go out and deliver it. And it yeah. seems to me that's the lesson of a lot of what you did at UCLA was you, you planted a seed and then it. It, it grew itself, you know, it started to self propagate. And that, that, that I think is interesting. That really resonates with, with where we are today in a lot of these conversations. Yeah, yeah. And we were also, I mean, luckily there was a lot going on in LA with the LA County Human Relations Commission, which was headed up then by Ron Wakabayashi, who mm -hmm. later was part of the Community Relations Service. Mm -hmm. So we were connected with other things going on in the city as well. And that was another source of satisfaction to, to be Amazing. involved in that. Well, I, I do want to open it up for everybody else to ask you some questions, but let's get to the NIH chapter. Okay. Because this is quite quite a bit different than obviously working in uh, at universities. You know, I mean, the scale of what you were tackling at NIH, I mean, it just blows my mind. 20,000 people, and you gave 70 introductory talks in your first year explaining the idea. I mean, you just had to sort of teach people what ombuds was. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about some of the work that you did, you know, uh, in this area of collaborative research. I think that's fascinating. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was um, an interesting thing that I did in the first year um, at NIH because they had not had an ombudsman before. Mm. So the whole idea was um, new which was great because it gave me the opportunity to define what the role was in the context of that organization. But one of the things we did, and again, this was not, um, it was not an act of genius, but it turned out to be a brilliant thing to do un unknowingly, is to, I set up a lecture series for the first year of four prominent people in the conflict resolution field to talk to in a, at NIH. And here's the, the brilliant luck thing. Because there are limited size to the auditoria that on, on campus and um, we decided that we would only invite leadership people to this lecture series. So there are 28 different institutes. So in each institute, there are like four top leaders, a director, a deputy director, a scientific director. It doesn't matter what the titles are. Wow. So it was an invitation only lecture series and everybody wanted to be able to go. Sure. Because it was invitation only. Um, but that helped spread the, the concept. A, a, a lot, um, and and again brought it to the attention of a lot of people in the organization who might not have been aware of the role 
um, had, had we not done that. Well, and, and I then, note that NIH has created the Gadlin Lecture Series in your honor. So clearly, yeah. uh, not only did it work for the first meetings, but it's, yeah. it's continued even in your legacy. So that's impressive. Yeah, that, that, that mattered a lot to me. That mattered a lot to me. But the, the work with scientists was, was really interesting because the scientists were not especially coming into the office. Um, but as I said, I was giving these different talks and um, over, over time, I, I noticed that when I talked with scientists about conflict resolution, it was a sort of lukewarm response. It was, it was less enthusiastic than other audiences. Mm. And as I had more and more contact with scientists, I came to realize that, I think I say this in the chapter, that, that science depends on conflict. Absolutely. Scientists are not necessarily interested in resolving conflicts. They wanna be able to engage in them in productive ways. Uh -huh. And so I had to sort of change the whole introductory talk about the ombuds role mm. and 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 science mm. and mm. talk about because I mean people were happy to learn about techniques that might allow them to better deal with an unproductive postdoc or an arrogant colleague or you know the interpersonal things that can foul scientific work mm -hmm. in some way or another. Um, but they also and, and the other thing that was going on at the same time in science is it was becoming increasingly collaborative and interdisciplinary, uh -huh, uh -huh. which meant it was not unlike the situation in LA where you have these people with multiple identities who are sometimes in conflict because of their identities. Well, you had something similar going on in science. Um, you know, you, you might have, I remember one obesity project that involved around 90 people and there were MDs, PhDs, social workers, nurses, uh, a variety of other people of different statuses. And it was very much like a multiple identity conflict in LA except it wasn't just, about, it wasn't about race or gender or those things. It was about the different disciplines. The bench scientists had contempt for psychologists because they weren't real sci scientists. Wow. Um, so increasingly the scientists, and you know, scientists are not known for their fascination with the fine points of social interaction. <laughs> it's not what they pay attention to. If they were interested in that, yeah. they would be in my job. They want to be looking in the microscope or, you know, uh, whatever else they might be doing. Sure. So coming along and working with them as they were suffering through their own complex problems of miscommunication, communication, interaction, rivalry, mm -hmm. Um, and people in science, and here's another way in which it's like identity, you don't separate someone's science from their person. It's mm. personal. If you have a theory or a procedure or a preferred way of a statistical analysis, that's not just an abstract thing. It, it's personal. Sure. It's a part of your identity. Well, so if you're if your reputation is based on a set of research findings and then someone else challenges those research findings, it can feel like it cuts to the core of who you are. And it is an identity based in a sense conflict. I mean, it is interesting. Conflict resolution programs grow out of the communities with which that they serve. I mean, we need to yes. meet our parties where they are. And I think it's very interesting. These three communities had very different personalities and yes. the, the systems that you built in each of them were different because it was, it was dictated by, the community that they grew out of. Obviously, yeah. students and grad students have a very different way of interacting with each other than a professional community like NIH, but you have to understand that culture before you can really get into the yeah. designing systems for dealing with a conflict yeah. that, that arises from it. 
And, and that's part of the pleasure of doing that work. It is like entering in another culture, mm-hmm. you know. And one of my practices always, and again, this is, you know, the, this is in the more brilliant dumb luck. Uh, at the beginning, um, when I, and, and I maintain that practice, when I was working with scientists who were in dispute, I would always ask to read some of their papers even though oftentimes I did not have the technical expertise to say, you really could make understand tales, right? organic yeah. chemistry paper or wh- whatever it may be. But it was a way of getting a sense of how they think, what they're working on, you know, and, and sometimes I would read a paper and it would have a half-life of understanding of 10 seconds <laughs> and 10 seconds later it was gone. But it was enough to be able to connect with them well, Plus, it also of course, yeah, it communicates a respect for their life's work, which is yeah. crucial in being able to work with them. Yeah, but it wasn't a technique, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, it, it was just sort of something I sort of did naturally. It seemed to make sense to do that. And of course, scientists are sometimes quite flattered to have anyone show an interest in their work. I remember sure. one man who I had said I'd like to, to see a couple of things of yours. Um, so he sent over two books and 10 articles. <laughs> <laughs> Read this before our session tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, let me just, before we open it up for questions, if you have yeah. anything you'd like to ask uh, of Howard, please don't hesitate to use the hand raise function uh, in Zoom. Um, but I, there's one last thing I wanted to get you to read before we opened it up. Okay. Howard. And it's actually the, the penultimate paragraph in your chapter on 314. And it starts, if we understand. Do you see that there? Yes. Yeah, the bottom paragraph. Mm-hmm. Read, read that one for me. If we understand the circumstances in which differences lead to destructive and unproductive conflicts, we should be able to create circumstances in which those differences can be harnessed cooperatively. I'm no longer naive. I do not believe we will ever get to the point where differences will not be the basis for conflict but we need not capitulate to destructive conflicts and we can work towards expanding the sensibility needed for cooperative action. I love that. Seems like a good project for retirement. I love that, I love that. And you're like the least retired, retired guy I know. So um, why don't we open it up and sure. see, um, see what comments, I mean, we have a lot of accumulated mediation expertise in the audience here. So um, I Hanok, I see you've got your hand up, please. Why don't you go first? Thank you all for setting this up. Um, I, I was a former organizational ombudsman at the University of North Dakota and an assistant at uh, University of California Merced. Oh, but I'm, I'm curious, once you entered the, the UC system, you talked about the kind of uh, bravado and, and chutzpah you had in when you had tenure at UMass. Did you ever have to rely on, on that that same sort of guts in at UCLA in the new situation, or um, you know, was there any self kind of regulating because of the lack of tenure there? No, at at that point, I I, I just I wasn't worried ab- about that anymore. I, it it just uh, there's something about giving up tenure that really frees you up. You know, then you're just like other people in the world. And um, the challenge of addressing some of the issues uh, was more exciting than any worry about the risk of, of getting in trouble. And I, I butted head, heads at, at some time. There are some things I, I can't talk about uh, because of confidentiality, but where I went to every possible resource within the university to get a problem addressed, and it was never addressed. Uh, but I did what I think an ombuds is supposed to do, is be a pain in the ass um, enough that they will at least pay attention. Um, but you don't win them all. Since I don't see a, another raised hand, may I, please, may I do a please, contextual follow-up? Follow yeah. uh, thank you. What, one of the differences in practices that I've seen, I don't know if it was the, the way at UCLA at, at, in your time, but certainly after your time, I knew one of the practices of UCLA was to do only a verbal report. 
whereas I know some other places do an annual report or every two years. I wanted to get your thoughts on the idea of a uh, verbal report versus uh, a written one for this. I think it's really, and I haven't always honored this, but that's for other reasons. I think it's really useful for an ombuds to do a public written report. Um, both giving some sense of what the range of cases were, what kinds of issues are, and some illustrations of uh, issues that are particularly prevalent within the organization. If you want to see a really good example of an annual report, go to the Asian Development Bank um, website. Wayne Blair is the ombudsman there and take a look at their annual report. You'll see something that I would consider a model. That's great. And I've yeah. never seen that in the IOA training materials, but uh, ombuds people should be a pain in the ass. Okay, yeah, that's good, I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't see another hand, so I'm gonna ask another question. You started your chapter with a John Cage quote. Yes. And the cage quote is, I want to free my music from memory and taste and from my likes and dislikes so that my music, instead of saying something that I have to say or expresses me, changes me. And I love that quote. And it's, it, it, it's not directly connected to your chapter. And I just wondered if you would speak for a moment to why did you select that quote? Because I feel the same way about the work I pursued. Um, I'm not a very social person, you know, just sort of left on my own, you know, in the wild, uh, or however you say that. Um, but I think I've always been drawn in the, in the way I said, I wanted to be pushed around by my life. Uh -huh. it, it's the same kind of thing. It's wanting experiences. And, and one of the things that doing the kind of work I did was it did change me. Mm -hmm. uh, and partly it changed me by putting me in a role where I would able, I would have to connect with a wide range of different kinds of people, mm -hmm. much, much different than when I was an academic, mm -hmm. uh, where I was mostly engaged with academics. And it was, it was really exciting to learn, to come to learn what it was like to be at a university if you were a janitor or a secretary. Right or a policeman or whatever it may be. And to be able to connect and have a way of connecting with those people that wasn't built around talking about what we had read recently or uh, uh. something like that. Well, I do think being an academic, again, I've only had dalliances as, as an adjunct, but I do, I feel like I meet academics who build a fortress out of their expertise yeah. and then they don't feel like they have to grow or change because like, look what I've done, look at this work, you know, and yeah. it, it, I think it almost insulates you from the hard work of dealing with some of the contradictions in your worldview uh, when you, when you have that kind of fortress. Yeah. So let's, let's go to uh, Vikram and then we'll go to Bob and then we'll go to Carl. Sure. So Vikram, you're next. How about that one paragraph that Colin and asked you to read? Says that at the end of 306, there's a sentence there, a mediator ombuds can't take away people's conflicts without giving them or helping them get something else in exchange, something that in some way addresses the same needs that the dispute did. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I wish I could think of a really good example off the top of, 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 of my head. So, all right, maybe this will do it. This comes out of when I was, um, was doing family mediation, okay? And I was, I had a woman lawyer partner and we, we, we were doing divorce mediation. And there was one couple we were working with. He was a truck driver and she was a therapist. And he very much thought of himself as a feminist and his wife was a feminist. And they were getting divorced because she, the wife had fallen in love with another woman and wanted to be with her. So they were getting divorced. 
And as we were going through the negotiations and talking about, they had two adolescent daughters. We were talking about child and, um, you know, where the children would live and visitation and finances and all of these kinds of things. But every time, and, and he would always say how much he supported her and how much he wanted her to be successful and how he, he, he was, wanted her to be happy. And every time we got close to an agreement around a particular important point, he would think of, an, of another reason to, to want to rethink that point of agreement. And then he would repeat, but how much he wanted to be able to support her and help her go on in her life and things like that. And in one of the sessions, I, I don't remember, third or fourth session or something like that, um, where the same pattern came over and over again. Um, and he, re, he had just objected to some aspect of the financial arrangement, then he had repeated how much he wanted his wife to be able to be successful. And I turned to him, this was not thought out in advance, and I said, you keep repeating how much you want, whatever her name was, to be happy and successful. I said, do you mean through all of this, you've never once thought I hope you're miserable. I hope our daughters turn against you. I hope your relationship falls apart. And with each word I said, the smile on his face got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then he acknowledged that he had felt those things. You know, and and um, a half an hour later, the whole divorce was settled. So there was in him a need to be able to feel and express the hurt and anger he felt. And my interpretation is that once that was able to be said, and and his wife who was a very thoughtful therapist. I, I remember her face while I was doing that. At first she looked surprised and then she relaxed and just let it happen. So there was this need of his that had to be satisfied for the ostensible conflict to be able to be resolved. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Bob. Um, Howard, uh, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to, and I'm going to draw on um, some past discussion. Yeah. I heard you talk um, about uh, um, feelings and the emotions. Um, I'm curious because you, you've always struck me and it is impressively um, as being able to uh, come across as, as very moderated and, and reasoned in the best sense of that, in the metal of, mm -hmm. uh, of just a temperament uh, that was, gave some measure of safety. Um, but then when you told me the story of your friend in the, uh, the sexual harassment case, yes, that after the third time uh, you went to him uh, and I heard even in your retelling of the story, some measure of anger or frustration with having heard about now the third instance yep. of, of this. I'm curious as to how much, and this is a specific technical question, you have brought in uh, your frustration, anger, and used it strategically uh, in your ombuds work. You're, you're beginning to touch on that as you talk about some of, I, your, some of your passion. You know, I, I think it changed over the years when I was first, when I first had Albie's class and things, things like that. I was trying to contain and control that kind of stuff, trying not to feel that. 
And the more experience I had, the more I came to realize that I had to be in touch with all of those feelings. Because if I wasn't, they were going to be controlling what I was doing. I wouldn't be controlling what I was doing. So being conscious of that, I try to be very conscious of every aspect of my feelings about the people I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And even if it means uncovering some pretty ugly stuff, you know, some people have heard me tell the story of, and this is not ugly, but I once had this kid, an uh, undergrad at um, UCLA, came to see me. It was four in the afternoon and he was unhappy about something about a grade, but there was something about the way he told this story that I found myself falling asleep, okay? So I thought maybe, and I don't fall asleep in normal times, let alone at work. So I brought the session to an end after, you know, I did, every, I did everything I could to stay awake. I brought the session to an end. I set up a meeting with him in the morning, the next day, figured it'd be fresh in the morning. I'd have my coffee. He comes in, it's like 9.15 in the morning, he starts talking and I'm falling asleep again. I mean, the same, I mean, I had this, and I had this unconscious reaction to him. It, it was, there was something I did not want to hear him and it wasn't in my control. So I, I managed to struggle through it and then I was able to get my colleague to do the follow-up work with him. But that's the only one I can think of where I couldn't figure out what it was that was going on. So your biology was telling you something. No kidding, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Howard, then let me, let me follow up then. You know, in all of these years, and, and as I suspect you would agree, um, you don't you don't rid yourself of your biases and your frustrations, angers, however they might show themselves. Right. Um, what would you, in taking the backward view of your career and this work in managing and dealing with conflict issues? What are the biases that you think you, you continue to carry that still concern you? Wow. That's a really good question. I, I don't... Um, I, never, I told you Bob was a master interviewer. That's yeah, great. Yeah, well, he is. It, it's very good. I don't... I haven't cataloged... My own issues is the, all I have to do. To, to I mean, my you know, it, there were certain kind of... Uh, like passive aggressive people um, strain my abilities. Strongly narcissistic people strain my credibilities. It, it's more certain types than it is uh, a certain demography, you know? Um, so, I mean, the two that first come to mind are the passive aggressive and, and narcissistic uh, are, are special challenges for me to find something that I can like in them or respect in them or sympathize with. So I, I, I'm cognizant of the time we are at the hour, but yeah. Carl, I wanted to get your, your question in before we broke, so. Yeah, thanks. I'm fascinated, Bob, with what you're saying, but I'd, I'd love to ask Howard, uh, I think of you, I don't know whether you'll see this as a compliment, but as part of a group in the early people in the founding of this field, like Christopher Moore and Bernie Mayer, and you folks represent the folks who are committed to socially, to social values, and coming out of different places for Bernie out of his Jewish background, Christopher out of his Quaker, but so you're early on confronting sexual harassment uh, before the rest of us are. Now we're several decades down the road, and now it's everywhere. But it, for me, the issue that I struggle with is this whole business of cancel culture. And are we, what are we doing with these situations? Are we shunning these people? Are we ostracizing them? 
is there some way instead to conceptualize this as a way to have people belong? And I'd really be interested in how you think of this these days. Yeah, wow, that's a whole thing on its own. I mean, I, you know, even the term cancel culture has gotten caught up in, is not a neutral description. It's already taking a certain kind of position. So I, I, I'm really interested in some, what appear to be some generational differences about how certain controversial topics get discussed or if they get discussed. And it's manifested itself most strongly in some of the controversies about the use of the N-word in classes where people, where they, not where it's used, but where it's referred to so that someone would read from a case that was about the use of the N-word. And then a big conflict develops about whether that quotation should have been used or not. And younger group of people, young for the most part, it's a younger cohort of people who feel they're not psychologically safe if they hear that. And an older cohort of people who feel they should be able to refer to it, they're not using it, they're not invoking the term. They're referring to someone else's use of the word. They're just mentioning it. So there, there, there's some, it's at least one dimension of it is a generational difference. And some of it pivots around this idea of psychological safety. And for me, who, when I went to school, I wanted the opposite of psychological safety. I wanted every part of my identity to be challenged and turned upside down. And I understand that there are other people for whom it's very different. That, 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 that things that challenge their or demean their identity um, it, it really has a negative impact on them. And I believe them, they're sin sincere, but it's so different from my experience. So I'm, I'm really, I'm actually working with a colleague to figure out if we can develop a way of, of addressing those kinds of things. I'm actually thinking that oh, and we need oh, another hour. I was about to say, Carl, yeah, I kind of want to do another hour just on that because I'm sure all of us have strong opinions. But I do want to respect Howard's time. I want to respect all of your time. Howard, I, I, have, I have four thank yous for you. One is for this session today, which was great. Two is for your chapter. Three is for this book, which is such a gift to the field and which I am just loving and I know all of us really appreciate. But the fourth is for your incredible career, doing this work and the model that you've given all of us. Um, so I want to, can we please do a round of applause to thank Howard for this time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And we will, uh, we will, this was recorded, so we'll put it together and we'll make it available. But thank you so much, Howard, for taking the time and thank you everyone for joining. And uh Hopefully we'll see you uh, next month in the next okay. in our series That's with Howard good. Bellman. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care and be well. Bye. Thank you.